Welcome to Liverpool City Region Creating Careers. We're joined on today's seminar by Peter Thornton and Colin Lavelle from Hill Dickinson. Thanks very much for everybody for uh, attending today. We're really looking forward to your informative sessions and students should have completed the pre-work set for this webinar. Um, and no doubt there'll be some interesting questions for the Q&A sessions, which we're gonna to host towards the end. Students, please use your Q&A button, which is on your screen at the bottom. Um, to post any questions that you may have either during or after the sessions. So I'm now going to hand straight over to Colin from Hill Dickinson and uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, thank, you. And thank you all for joining us today. Here we go. Thank you. So, as, uh, as explained, um, Peter and I are going to talk to you today about um, the shipping team within Hill Dickinson. We've been asked by uh, MAST to be able to share our experiences of working within the marine sector in the area of law. So, um, so what we're going to cover is um, who, who is Hill Dickinson, um, what roles we have at Hill Dickinson, sorts of career pathways you can take, uh, to, uh, to take on those roles. Uh, we're also going to give you an insight into a day in the life for each of us. Um, and also then, if you, you are interested in pursuing that further, give you a bit of an idea as to what Hill Dickinson is looking for, what you can do now. And if you were looking to be applying to Hill Dickinson this year, what the key dates are that you would need to be looking uh, at. And then after that, um, there will be a little uh, period for any questions um, and answers that uh, you might have following this. So, who is Hill Dickinson? Well, we are an international commercial law firm founded in Liverpool in 1810. We uh, specifically were involved in insurance and marine law at that time. And so, well, what is a commercial law firm? Well, commercial law firms are uh, quite common. They generally provide legal advice to businesses and individuals in relation to contracts or disputes. So that is what we would call contentious business, which would be disputes, litigation, or non-contentious business, such as contracts or transactional work. And then how does Hill Dickinson fit into the marine maritime world? Well, as I mentioned, Peter and I both sit within the marine business group within Hill Dickinson. Uh, I work uh, in the shipping team, and Peter is currently located within the yachts team and the yachts practice in uh, London. But as well as uh, maritime, we also have a, a, a significant focus on the health uh, side of work and also uh, business services, which would include things like property law, employment, commercial and corporate. Next slide, please, Peter. So here's a little video as, which gives you a bit more of an introduction to Hill Dickinson, which I hope you enjoy.
Thank you, Peter. So that uh, gave you a bit gave you a bit more of a detailed um, uh, insight into the business. Um, as you saw from that, we have nine offices worldwide, five of those in the UK, as well as here in Liverpool, we have offices in Leeds, uh, Manchester, and of course we have two offices in London, uh, where Peter is based. Um, and as well as that, um, uh, we have overseas offices in Hong Kong, Piraeus, um, uh, Monaco, and Singapore. Now, all of those offices, as it turns out, are part of the Marine Business Group. So um, they are all part of the, the teams and the people that we regularly work with. Now, across those offices, we have about 850 employees. They include broadly two categories of employee, lawyers broken down into partners, legal directors such as myself, associates, trainees such as Peter, paralegals, and also support staff, uh, which includes secretaries, IT experts, an accounting team, specialist analysts, and then consultants, although consultants will span both of those sides. Now, what we're going to talk about, what Peter's going to talk about shortly is, a, uh, is the route into law, uh, in a traditional sense, although Peter and I both have rather unconventional roots into law. Uh, myself, um, I did a degree in agriculture before I went, before I uh, started down this road. Then I converted into law, thinking I would do agricultural law, started specialising in environmental work, and then joined Hill Dickinson to help them with an environmental case they had on for one of the ports. And really, the rest is history. And as, as you'll find out from Peter, Peter is, uh, has, a, has an interesting background as well. So at this point, I'll uh, hand over to Peter uh, for the next part of the presentation. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Colin just mentioned, my name is Peter Thornton and I am a trainee solicitor at uh, Hill Dickinson. Uh, so I'm gonna be taking you through the pathways to becoming a lawyer uh, and uh, therefore we shall kick straight off. Uh, so what we're looking at uh, is the standard uh, route into uh, becoming a lawyer uh, is that you first need to gain a law degree uh, or uh, an equivalent qualification, uh, which is really to make sure that you are eligible uh, to take the first legal vocational course, uh, which uh, is depending upon uh, whether you want to be a solicitor or barrister. So as you can see at the top there, uh, you can either do the three-year law degree uh, or uh, if you decide to do something different initially at university, uh, you will need to do a one-year graduate diploma in law in order to convert uh, into, into law, uh, which will then allow you to do the vocational courses, uh, as you can see on the screen there. It's either a one-year legal practice course uh, or uh, if you decide that you want to be a barrister rather than a solicitor, it's a one year bar professional training course. So it's at this point you need to uh, ideally decide which route you want to take. Uh, now, as a quick background as to the difference between a solicitor and, and a barrister. Well, a solicitor uh, like myself and, uh, and Colin, we tend to deal directly with the, the clients right from an outset. Uh, of a matter uh, and this is often on a regular basis uh, and it's it, we really provide a go-to point of contact uh, for the client which uh, which of course can actually span uh, over many years the relationship between a solicitor and uh, and a client uh, whereas a barrister uh, generally uh, only gets involved uh, with a client uh, and their solicitor when there's a dispute uh, that comes up uh, and of course they will be needed to argue the case uh, in court on behalf of the client. Uh, so once you've decided whether you really want to become a solicitor or a barrister, uh, you conduct that vocational course and then it's after that point uh, that uh, firms such as Hill Dickinson uh, would get involved uh, for the solicitors uh, who uh, can then come to Hill Dickinson and apply for what is known as a training contract. Uh, and Hill Dickinson um, can offer such training contracts to a select few aspiring solicitors who have completed uh, their one year LPC, uh, whereas barristers will go off uh, and they'll conduct a pupillage at Chambers. But today uh, we're going to be concentrating on solicitors uh, as Hill Dickinson is a firm of solicitors. Now with Hill Dickinson, uh, although the head office is based in uh, the wonderful city of Liverpool, uh, the firm is an international law firm, uh, so the competition is certainly tough 
for those training contracts. Uh, and especially as there are certainly attractive transfer opportunities around the world for those who are interested. Now, with well over a thousand applications uh, to Hill Dickinson every year for training contracts, uh, you'll need to know that actually there are only 15 places available each year. Uh, so, you know, in, in addition to realizing that it is tough to gain one of these training contracts, it's also important to realize uh, the time between application uh, of a training contract and the actual training contract starting. Uh, so, for example, this year, Hill Dickinson will be starting to take applications next month for training contracts that don't actually start until 2023. However, don't let that put you off. Uh, in fact, uh, you should be um, prepared uh, to, uh, to come for your training contract, uh, but the idea is to apply early. Okay, so once the successful trainee uh, is taken up on the training contract, uh, you'll be welcomed certainly into Hill Dickinson for a two-year training contract, which is basically where you learn to become a lawyer. Now here in Hill Dickinson, uh, as Colin mentioned, there are three particular main specializations or sectors uh, and we cover business, health or marine, uh, whereas Colin and myself are both in the marine sector. Uh, and then as a trainee, you'll get the chance to to experience a number of different sub areas, usually about four sub areas, which are otherwise known as seats. And it's during this time uh, that you'll be able to uh, learn what it's like uh, in all of the different sectors, which uh, nicely leads me on to handing back to Colin, uh, who will give you an insight into his career path and of course, a day in his life. So Colin, over to you again. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing this slide so that you can see Colin. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, right, so when um, we were asked to contribute to this series, um, we thought, what is the best way of being able to give you an insight into what our job in the maritime sector in the legal uh, field um, involves? And we thought possibly the best way to do that was to take you through a day in the life. Now, it probably wouldn't give you a fair reflection of what we what we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis at this time, given the you know, current uh, uh, COVID-related restrictions. So the day I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into uh, was last year, uh, last summer specifically, which was quite a full day, which I thought was uh, it's, it's not necessarily typical, but I thought it was a good example of the various things we have to do. And a big part of this you will see uh, uh, relate to actually helping develop and build the business in which we're in. So. The day in question was an early start, it was a 5.30 start. I had a 7 a.m. train to catch, and that was because it was London International Shipping Week, where there are many uh, events and conferences that we try to get to to be able to see people and also to speak at. Um, so when I was on the train at seven o'clock, my thoughts turned to the coming day of seminars and receptions, at which I wanted to further my understanding of what was happening in the, sh in the shipping market, because the shipping market is uh, dynamic, it's always uh, changing and it's important. Um, in order to keep the competitive edge to make sure that we are up to speed with what's happening. Uh, and also as a chance to promote Hill Dickinson and the Northwest shipping sector. Well, as I was going through my emails, I noted I'd received an, inst an instruction to advise on the arrest of a vessel. Now, ship arrest is something we deal with commonly, and it's normally it's a means of securing uh, or obtaining security for a debt. Now, that instruction had come from a colleague in our Greek office who had a Greek client who was owed some money by the ship owner and it appeared to be fairly urgent as the vessel was due to arrive in Liverpool the next day. So over breakfast, I was able to access the Lloyd's database of vessels where I could find out who owned the vessel and where she was and where she was going. And I noted that the vessel was indeed due to be in Liverpool tomorrow and was owned by the debtor. In the circumstances, I set about considering the papers and preparing and prepared an urgent advice to the client advising on likely costs, timescales and outcomes. And that was just in time for arrival at London Euston when I headed over to our London city office for the first seminar of the day. On the way, I bumped into a client who is specialist at providing private maritime security con contractors to secure ships when they are transiting difficult parts of the world. And during our conversation, I noted that he was branching into cyber security on super yachts, an area that we actually provided some advice on. So I was able to set up an informal meeting between him and my colleagues in our yacht team where Peter works. 
at half past nine, I managed to uh, get to the office and I joined uh, the talk we, we were taking we were taking part in then, which was the maritime casualties and the legal challenges in an automated environment. The first session, which was on automated shipping, i.e. crewless ships, which seems to be the talk at the moment of the future of shipping, was followed by what had become a lively debate between the panel as to whether automated shipping would take place naturally by evolution of the industry or by a far quicker and far more disruptive revolution. Um, that given that that seemed to be a hot topic, I shared that on LinkedIn and you will all be aware of the importance of social media um, generally, but also in a business context, uh, which is a great way to raise profile. And um, by lunchtime, the post I had shared on that had already had 800 views, so it just shows how effective that is. Um, I managed to grab lunch then at noon with the delegates, networking with them and discovering how polarizing the autonomous shipping debate is. Um, and then I checked in with the Liverpool office to finalize travel arrangements for a forthcoming business trip I had to Washington DC uh, and to Florida. And that was in order to update the client on a long running arbitration and also to inspect and survey their manufacturing and distribution facilities in the United States. Um, after lunch, I headed over to uh, a Mersey Maritime seminar that was investing in a connected future. And that was hosted by BBC Breakfast host Louise Minchin, that some of you will be familiar with. Um, and consisted of presentations on the crucial nature of innovation, the importance of connectivity, and critically what we're talking about here today, the development of skills. The common thread to all of the contributions was a blend of sector passion and the importance of collaboration, which is very important these days in our uh, globally connected world. Um, just at about half past three, I received an email confirming that the advice on the vessel arrest, as I'd given in the morning, was being considered by the client and instructions to proceed were likely to be received the next morning once the client had had a chance to consider the consequences. I also received feedback from another client um, who had provided some advice in relation to the terms I had drafted for the provision of port services earlier in the week. At five o'clock I grabbed a coffee and, and did uh, more networking with delegates before heading to the next event which was at the Lloyds building uh, which was an event hosted by Peel Ports who were very excited about their announcement that they were going to be um, adding the benefit of a new container carrying rail service from the port to both Scotland and the south of England. At seven o'clock, I left there and headed over to the next event, which is the Naval Club in Mayfair for a reception hosted by the Propeller Club of London. Now, this was interesting because at this event, there was a presentation by the families of six UK ex-servicemen who had been unlawfully detained and imprisoned in India, in Chennai, for six years following their arrival on board a merchant ship on which they had been lawfully employed as private security contractors. Their families had been striving to raise the profile of their husband's plights to secure their release with the support of the Propeller Club and the maritime community. The presentation was very moving and the conditions in which the Chennai Six were being forced to live in were deplorable. I'm delighted to be able to tell you that uh, the campaign was successful and the Chennai Six had, have since been released and returned to the UK. And that just shows the power of that collaboration and networking. I also took the chance to touch base with my contacts on LinkedIn and I noticed that I'd received an invitation to have a tour of the Port of Garston on the return to Liverpool. Uh, a client of ours uh, runs and operates the Port of Garston there. I then grabbed a taxi back to Euston to catch my 907 train back to Liverpool uh, and whilst I was on the train I uh, was reviewing my emails and noticed that the instructions to arrest the vessel on her arrival in Liverpool tomorrow had been received. In the circumstances, I then prepared the claim papers and supporting witness statement for the arrest whilst on the train. And then the next morning, we were able to arrest the vessel. Um, out of interest, um, we'd secured the receipt of the funds, the outstanding funds from the debtor by the end of the week. So it just shows how effective uh, ship arrest is. And then finally, I arrived back in Liverpool about half past 11 before I headed home uh, for the day. Uh, and that is really a day in the life that hopefully gives you a bit of an insight into uh, the sort of uh, aspects Involved. Back to uh, thank you very much Colin. Uh, so over to me for a bit of a background on how I came to be in Hill Dickinson and uh, a very brief day in the life for me. Uh, so uh, like Colin uh, I didn't come straight to Hill Dickinson, I didn't go straight to university. Um, I, uh, I actually went to sea when I first turned 18 uh, and I ended up uh, signing up for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary to see the world as a seafarer. 
uh, which are actually the large grey ships that you often see in Birkenhead and Liverpool. Uh, now, Colin has also persuaded me uh, to share with you a few photographs of, uh, of some ships and yachts, which I'm so sure you will be delighted uh, with. So I'm just going to share my screen again uh, and, uh, and you'll be able to see them. So bear with me. OK, that's uh, our lovely faces, of course. Um, but coming up, uh, so this is, uh, this is me. This is the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Uh, and uh, this is what I did for the first 15 years of my career. So 18, uh, 18, at age 18 onwards. Uh, in fact, a month after my 18th birthday, I found myself sailing out to the Adriatic in support of peacekeeping operations out there. Uh, but uh, as a merchant Navy deck officer, uh, I'd spent that 15 years working alongside the Royal Navy, uh, as you can see down there. Uh, and I ended up reaching the rank of uh, first officer, or for those of you who are uh, afraid with military ranks, uh, equivalent to a lieutenant commander. Uh, now that provided me with many, many wonderful opportunities to learn not only how to drive uh, large ships and have numerous adventures uh, all around the world, uh, but also strive for promotion and importantly, uh, put myself forward for regular assessments and exams. Uh, I must admit, even when I wasn't sure how well I would do. Now, the reason I'm telling you about these, uh, these exams and the exam results is that they were uh, vital in making sure that I was eligible, uh, having not been to university uh, after I left school, uh, that I was eligible uh, to attend the graduate law course uh, to become a lawyer. Uh, so my message to you guys right now is probably if you don't know what you want to do when you leave school or college, well, don't worry about it. Uh, but the important thing is not to stop learning and getting qualifications. Uh, now, these can be both vocational and academic uh, because you, uh, you may not know just when they will come in handy later on. However, uh, after my 15 years in the RFA uh, and before I made my move into law, I also wanted to achieve what I'd worked so hard for at sea uh, and take command of my own vessel. Uh, so uh, I ended up uh, moving into the super yacht sector uh, and I had a wonderful uh, seven years or so as chief officer and then captain uh, on ships such as these. Uh, so driving a number of yachts, both small and large, uh, around. So that top left one is Mosaic. I was chief officer on her in the Mediterranean, uh, running charter um, uh, charter operations. And then the other vessels, top right is M5, uh, a very large sailing vessel. In fact, you can see the size of the, uh, the, uh, the crew on board there if you look closely. Uh, and then Sea Eagle is bottom right, which I spent a, a lot of time on in the, uh, in the Pacific and, and Caribbean, which was, which was great fun. Uh, but I also uh, managed to come alongside and do the Clipper uh, race, uh, which is another part of my yachting background. Uh, and you might recognize that vessel because uh, it was two years ago that uh, the Clipper race came in and out of Liverpool. So the Clipper race actually started in Liverpool and finished in Liverpool. So I included these, uh, these pictures uh, in case some of you were down there on the docks uh, to see all of the racing yachts. So it was great fun. Uh, and, uh, and I really wanted to highlight uh, that for me to get the job at Hill Dickinson, it was, it was not only my perseverance in attaining extra academic qualifications once I'd left the, the standard school and college, uh, but it was uh, my industry experience in shipping and yachting uh, that really helped me stand out for Hill Dickinson. Uh, so here you can see it's what is Hill Dickinson looking for. Uh, well, I've, I've picked out three of those elements that I think are the most important. Uh, the first one is uh, that top one, the strong academics, uh, because that will show your ability to apply yourself. The second is commercial awareness. Uh, commercial awareness is certainly one of those things uh, that will help you stand out uh, and uh, show so that you are interested in the sector that you will be applying for, whether that's a business uh, or, uh, of course, marine for the likes of us uh, or health uh, within Hill Dickinson being the three main areas. And then the third one on this bit is that last one, individuality. Uh, again, it links into what makes you different 
uh, because uh, there are only 15 seats out of all, out of all of those applications. Uh, so you need to uh, have something, uh, something special about you. Okay, and then going on to the next slide, uh, what can you do about that? Uh, well, again, I've looked at three main points in this slide. Uh, and I think the first one is at the top there. Be clear on why a career in law uh, is for you and how to demonstrate commitment. Uh, the reason I picked that one out is because it takes time to demonstrate commitment. You can't just sort of pitch up uh, and uh, having thought about it the day before. The second uh, big point from here is target particular firms. Uh, now that is important because uh, we want to see, or I should say that the law firm such as Hill Dickinson will want to see uh, why you're enthusiastic about a particular uh, specialization. Uh, and again, that's in that business or health or marine sector. And then thirdly, anticipate and prepare this one down here in the bottom right hand side. So uh, instead of pitching up to interview all your assessment days uh, without doing any research, uh, it is it is very important that you prepare and practice uh, the tests. In fact, if you go on the Hill Dickinson website, uh, there are free psychometric tests that you can you can try and see how well you do. Uh, but it's all about thinking ahead and making sure that you're ready. Uh, so finally, uh, final slide, uh, just a few key dates uh, for you to be aware of. Uh, so at the top there, 8th of October, the end of this week, if you go and Google uh, legal cheek, uh, you might be able to find their virtual law fair uh, and uh, register to get online to, to witness uh, a law fair. Uh, and then you can see for those that are in the position where they might want to be looking to apply to Hill Dickinson, uh, the applications actually open uh, next month, 1st of November. Uh, but the thing is right now is to get online, get on the, uh, the website and, and have a look at all the information there. So that's it from uh, from me, and uh, I'm going to open up again now to the floor uh, for questions uh, to myself and Colin. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Colin. That was a really informative session. Um, lots of information, lots of things to think about. And um, so before we do open up the question and answer session, um, I just really wanted to ask you both. Um, I know that you're, I think, currently both working from home and I know PT just mentioned about going into the office, but I think it'd be good maybe to just give our students a little bit of an insight into uh, obviously the effects of COVID and how that's maybe changed your, your, your working day or your working week. Um, and just give us a little bit of an insight into how that's working across Hill Dickinson. Okay, <clears throat> happy for me to ask that, Peter? Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, so uh, for me, um, I'm uh, working from home, have been since since lockdown and uh, sort of really living in our, our bubble. Um, Hill Dickinson sort of invested some years ago quite heavily into um, everybody across the business. So wh whatever role they're in, having laptops and having the capability to work remotely, um, which has been a great uh, setup for, for what turned out to be uh, the necessity of working from home because we already had laptops, we were already geared up to work from home. So pretty seamlessly, we were able to continue picking up emails, uh, to continue working. And, and clients and businesses were all doing the same thing, which was important, as were the courts. So uh, we were able to start, you know, continue with hearings through Teams or Zoom meetings uh, as if we were in the office or as if we were in the courtroom. So <clears throat> from our point of view in our sector, um, it's actually been a relatively seamless transition uh, to working from home from that point of view. Subject, of course, to children wandering in <clears throat> in the middle of presentations or hearings and that sort of thing. So, yes. No, thank you for that. Um, so one of the first questions we had in, um, Peter, I'll ask this of you really, it says about um, when they're choosing options for GCSE or A-levels, are there any mm -hmm. other subjects that you would recommend other than English and maths? Uh, other than the usual um, uh, message of, of do those subjects that you're interested in, uh, because you tend to do better in those, uh, I would uh, I would say uh, the sciences certainly come in handy, uh, and really it's it's those subjects uh, that you can apply later on. Um, so think about it, even if you don't want to go into a job at the beginning that has maths or English as the as sort of the main requirement. 
uh, think of the subjects such as languages that you might be able to use uh, elsewhere, not just in the likes of a law firm, but it will open up doors for you. So it's subjects that will will uh, make your life easier uh, in, the, in, in the later stages. Thank you. And next question, Colin, I'll ask this one of you. Um, lots of people talk about the positives. What are the negatives about the job that you do and are they worth it? What are the negatives? Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> um, I think I think probably the challenges uh, could be uh, could include um, the sort of the demands on your time. So, for instance, um, um, you know, clients, if, if, for instance, ship arrests or if there's a casualty, there's sorts of instructions that can't really wait until Monday morning for you to start dealing with them. Or if there's been a casualty on board a ship, for instance, um, some of the instructions we have are of, of quite a, an urgent nature. Um, and so a challenge with, with dealing with that is that um, as part of your um, uh, sort of as, as part of my job, really, I'm I'm giving my sort of uh, contact details out to all clients whenever they need to get hold of me. So that could be at three o'clock in the morning or it could be on a Saturday afternoon in the summer when you're, you're setting up a barbecue and suddenly you've got to drop everything and go and deal with whatever it is that's happening. Um, so that's a challenge. But I think if you enjoy what you do. And if you enjoy doing that sort of thing, then it's the challenge is, is, is minimized. Um, uh, and I think in the sector we work in, in the marine maritime sector, it's such a pragmatic, commercial, down to earth, enjoyable sector to be part of, which obviously helps support a greater sort of um, key sector and key industry. It's really sort of feels very worthwhile when you're doing things like that. So I'd say in terms of a challenge, that's potentially a challenge and I think there's a challenge there with with the family life as well when you've got young children that it can sometimes impinge on things and I think as long as there is a quid pro quo that you're able to give back a bit of time at another time when you might otherwise not be able to with a, with a traditional job and um, then I you know that's well understood and well received with the family so I think from that point of view that's uh, that's probably one of the challenges that you, you takes a bit of getting used to but it's actually uh, pretty enjoyable. Thank you. And Peter, a question for you, um, and obviously with your background as well. Um, is there anything anything that you could do in your spare time that would help our students to gain skills or, or um, maybe some volunteering that would look good when applying for a role at Hill Dickinson? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're know, serious about becoming a lawyer or, or, or working in a law firm, anything that assists uh, showing that you are interested in, in law and have been for a, a bit of time rather than just thinking that this, this is, oh, that looks like a nice uh, big office and comfy. I'm going to go and try out there next week uh, is useful. So I would say ask family friends uh, if they know of anybody that uh, is involved in a law firm. Uh, they might be able to get uh, a little bit of a, a sort of assistance um, volunteering at uh, centers uh, the likes of um, uh, citizens advice and bits and pieces like uh, that or, or should I say services like that charities ch basically it's all about helping people to be a, uh, becoming a lawyer is about assisting and uh, offering advice so that uh, other people can can uh, do what they want to do so it's that sort of that sort of stuff I would advise so uh, volunteering, charity work or citizens advice, um, getting involved in that that area. Uh, Colin might have some other ideas in the local area, I'm not sure. Well, well I, th I agree with all of that uh, and I think the other thing to bear in mind is it's a highly competitive environment that you know, uh, you'd be applying for um, and so bear in mind that lots of other people's CVs will have lots of things that you, you, know, that you might think of ordinarily but anything that gives you, that allows you to demonstrate Good commercial awareness, uh, dealing with money, dealing with sort of making decisions on sort of um, uh, business related activities or anything that helps you're able to demonstrate sort of interpersonal skills, because obviously your relationship with your clients is a, or your ability to work well with people is a really good, uh, really good selling point, I think, as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and just one final question, just to close this part of the session, um, which is coming, which is um, Peter. Have you been on a yacht with any celebrities? <laughs> uh, how do I answer this by keeping my confidentiality agreements intact? Uh, I would say 
No, I've not been on a yacht with any uh, big celebrities that you might have heard of. Uh, most of the yachts that I'm, uh, I've been involved in are owned by very uh, wealthy businessmen. And you'll be pleased, to know, well, not necessarily pleased to know, but uh, they tend to be far more wealthy than, uh, than celebrities. But as a, as a side story, I did once get to, to see Rihanna uh, for, at, a, at a relatively close distance on another yacht that was at anchor, only about uh, you know, sort of 50 yards away. So uh, that, probably about as close as I've got to any celebrity uh, that, uh, that, has, that has come on board in that sense. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I think that will close this session. Um, so I want to thank you both for coming on and sharing with us your career journeys and um, some insights into becoming a lawyer. And I think more importantly for this section is around understanding what goes on in the maritime sector across Liverpool City region. So thank you very much. Thank you. Students, don't forget to check out our Creating Careers Roadmap to evaluate today's session. Please go to our website, growthplatform.org forward slash talent, where you'll find our employer video series on our YouTube channel and student pre-work resources. If you've got any further questions, please contact the Careers Hub team, careershub at growthplatform.org. Thanks for joining.